Thank you very much and welcome to our session. I'm, I'm really happy to um, have organised the session and have such a great range of experts to speak on this topic. So the aim of the session is to discuss some of the existing, open and new challenges in the face of recent developments of conversational AI. So up until relatively recently, the possibility of AI that can convincingly use language in a human-like manner seemed to be a much more distant goal rather than something that we would all be playing with and testing um, daily now. Um, so we've made some really incredible progress towards successfully modeling human language. Um, and uh, I think maybe something that makes it particularly convincing is that conversation is such a, a human-like way of communicating. And so it's a very natural form of interaction with technology for us. Um, so I'm very happy that our panelists have agreed to be here today, and I'm just going to briefly introduce them to you. Uh, so I have Tanzi Dinkar here. Um, she's a research associate at Harriet Watt University working on safety in conversational AI. She also has work studying the representations of disfluencies, so the ums and ahs and repetitions that make language in conversation very human-like, um, and how they can be modelled as informative signals of communication. Um, I also have um, Chris Lucas, and he is a reader in cognitive science at the University of Edinburgh, and his research involves the combination of machine learning and um, experimental psychology, through which he aims to shed light on how people make sense of the world around them. So this includes the human ability to seek out and generate explanations, discover causal relationships, and combine experience and social communication to discover new concepts. We also have Marwa Mahmoud, and she is a lecturer in socially intelligent technologies in the School of Computing at the University of Glasgow. She's also a visiting fellow in the de Department of Computer Science and Technology at the University of Cambridge. And um, her research interests focus on computer vision for social signal processing and um, behavior modeling, especially within the context of effective computing. And finally, we have Oliver Lemon, uh, who is a professor at Harriet Watt University and co-founder of Alana AI, a leading Scottish conversational AI company. Oliver has had a long career working in dialogue modeling and ex his expertise spans a wide range of topics within AI, NLP and robotics, and his interests are in NLP, machine learning, multimodal interfaces, and human-robot interaction. Um, so, sorry for talking so long here. Um, I, um, I'm looking forward to an interactive discussion. We've prepared some questions to put to the panel initially. Um, and that we'll discuss, but we're hoping for a lot of audience participation. The questions will come in to me. We've got both from in person and online. Um, and I'll do my best to, to, to get our panelists to speak to these. We're hoping to discuss on the topics of how audience aware and adaptive we wish for conversational technologies to be, um, how human like, explainable, and therefore trustworthy such systems can be, and then a view towards the future of. Um, and a view on the future. So let's start off the panel with all of the panelists answering the question of what are some examples of AI advances that you're currently working on and understanding audience aware and adaptive conversational AI. So maybe one of you wants to volunteer to start. Oh, I, uh, I can start. So first of all, thank you for inviting me to join this panel. So um, in general, we don't speak the same way that we write. We're disfluent. You can think of disfluencies as the opposite of fluency. So that's when we tend to repeat ourselves. We tend to interrupt ourselves, interrupt the other person, and sort of hesitate and say, uh, um, et cetera. Now, there's lots of linguistic research to show that these are informative signals of communication. However, when we're thinking of task-oriented dialogue systems and conversational AI, all of these disfluencies and signals of communication are removed as noise. Um, however, they can be very informative linguistic cues. So for example, they inform us of the linguistic structure of an utterance. Disfluencies in prosody, for example, are used by the speaker and the listener to tell different structures of the utterance. I don't say things like, my name is Thanvi, full stop, right? Um, so basically, disfluencies also indicate like larger shifts in topical units. And my research is focused on how we can integrate disfluencies in a sort of computational way that can give structure to the utterance. So I think if we want to move from sort of task-oriented dialogues to open conversations, we should sort of uh, include these different like linguistic signals that offer structure to the utterance. 
Thank you. You ready, Chris? Um, yeah, so I guess as it relates to conversational AI, um, one direction of my research that I am very excited about is um, explanation, and in particular causal explanations of the sort you might ask for if someone is making a decision that you don't fully understand, where by someone we might mean a human, but we al also might mean uh, a self-driving car where you're in the passenger seat and you're a little bit nervous. Um, and this is a, a lively topic in machine learning. There's a, there's a big subfield of explainable AI, but a lot of this focuses on um, basically saying, oh, there's not a complete philosophical consensus over what an explanation is, so we'll define it in this narrow technical way, in a, in a way that often doesn't really comport with the kinds of explanations that people tend to give and they t tend to expect of other people. And there's this big cognitive science literature that um, people, including my research group, I think are beginning to get a nice formal handle on where we can actually compose it with the kinds of systems that are actually being used in self-driving cars to yield explanations of the sort that we can document that people like. Um, I think that's enough to say for that. Yeah, thank you very much. Really interesting. Marla. Okay, for, so for my work, I think I'm looking at the bigger picture in a way. So yeah, when we think about conversational AI, at least many of you now are just thinking of the chatbot that we just type stuff to, or just Alexa or any of these ones, which just understands the language and respond. But well, I'm interested in the multimodality factor. So, I mean, the agent could be in the car, as, as you mentioned, it could be actually a robot, it could be an embodied agent or, a, or something that's actually embedded. So, and the multimodality is another factor. So the way we, see, we say the sentence makes a difference, right? So, and it's not, and when we interact with each other in a human-like <coughs> nature, we don't only hear the text and reply, we actually include much more than that, the context, the situation, the facial expressions, the gestures. So I'm interested in human behavior understanding, especially on the vision part, but also how to do the multimodality factor, how we actually get signals from multiple sensors, could be the video, the audio, the text, how, how we can integrate all of that to basically understand the situation or a sentence, and also how can we produce kind of the response based on that, based on the person talking, the situation, <coughs> the emotion, et cetera. So lots of, lots of these stuff. So um, lots of challenges with that work from a technical side of view. So how do you mix these modalities, multimodal representation? How can we translate from one modality to another? Um, I think many even of the models that are out there now are planning to have kind of a visual part as well. How can we understand um, maybe an image and how can this be added as a kind of as an input and also as an output as well? So. Yeah, that's kind of the general idea. I can talk more about specific parts later on. Yeah, thank you. I'll ask you more about it. Oliver, what are you yeah, working on in this area? Thanks. Uh, so yeah, in our, in our lab and in our company, there are really, I guess, two main themes that we're focused on, and they are safety and adaptivity. So on the first theme, safety of these conversational systems is, I think, as everyone understands, now really paramount because um, they are very good at providing what looks like very convincing content and very persuasive content at very large scale and at large speed. And the problem with that is that it's uh, a really amazing tool for uh, to do bullshit generation, frankly. Um, so there's a lot of problems around making sure that whatever these systems output is actually what we call grounded. Grounded means related to a particular, say, document or website or trusted information source, or even in the work we're doing on visual conversation, we want the output of the system to be grounded in a, in a particular image or in a 3D scene and that kind of thing. So on safety, we're working on several dimensions of trying to make these systems actually safe and grounded. And then in adaptivity, we have several projects trying to make these systems sensitive to different user groups. So we're working, for example, with blind and partially sighted people, also people who've had a stroke, um, and elderly people with memory problems. And in each of these cases, a conversational system needs to adapt to particular types of interaction uh, for that specific user group. And there's a lot of questions about how you can uh, adapt systems appropriately for different user groups. So in a nutshell, those two things. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so I guess uh, a common theme of what you're all talking about here is this development for um, 
conversational systems to become more and more multimodal and um, beyond these modalities and I guess becoming more and more human-like. So I, I was hoping that you could maybe answer a little towards what are these desirable human-like traits either in the multimodal sense, you've all touched on this now, um, or undesirable human-like traits that you can see as, as needing to become incorporated or challenges that are faced in incorporating these. So who, maybe you don't necessarily have to take turns if one of you or, or we do anyway. So I'm, I'm happy ah, to, okay. sorry, just to talk about yeah. a desirable human trait yeah. which I think is not really represented in current systems, and that's the ability to negotiate mm. and collaborate. Yeah. Um, so there's a kind of interesting bunch of research around the idea of negotiating meanings, but also negotiating tasks and responsibilities for who's doing what. Um, so that to me is like one of the main human-like intelligent traits that these systems don't yet capture. And I'll just stop there. <laughs> Ooh, okay, I can add, uh, well, for me, because I'm interested in this nonverbal signal, so yeah. I'm actually interested, I mean, I would want to see empathy in the in these agents so it's not just answer with facts but maybe they can understand more of like the way I'm asking the question they might have a personality I mean there are multiple there are lots of research areas on on that side as well and also yeah I mean so this kind of understanding the nonverbal kind of part of the speech and responding as well accordingly um, depends on different situations different contexts so yeah that's what I would add um, I might say discretion. So, um, as I said, explanation is near and dear to me. And one thing that tends to be um, a marker of good human explanations is that you pick out the things that matter for the person you're talking to. Um, you know, if you're, if you're talking about what contributed to the forest fire, you don't say that oxygen in the atmosphere is, is a cause, right? Like, that's sort of obvious to people. Um, and I think... For those of us who play with ChatGPT, my experience with it has been that if I ask it a question about something, it'll sort of ramble on for three paragraphs giving me boilerplate before maybe saying the thing that I'm after. So I think knowing something a little bit about your audience and what they care about and using that to exercise some discretion is um, something that maybe we can move toward. Yeah, I think, it's really, I think it ties your two points about needing more context, needing more understanding of the user. Maybe I'd be really interested to hear what you say on this. Uh, yeah, I think it's sort of following negotiation. I think that, you know, having realistic turn taking is so important. Like mm -hmm. the way we right now converse with these systems, it's so sort of like formulaic. You have to really formulate your utterance well to make sure that the system understands. So I think that, again, coming to analyze different signals of communication could be very useful for things like realistic turn taking. Yeah. Or maybe also the disfluency stuff comes into yes. this, like when to butt in, when yeah, exactly. maybe if I say, uh, uh, I want to make sure that I am heard in the versus not. So would you say that you want maybe models to show this disfluency or, or not? Or Well, I think that um, in terms of models to analyze disfluencies, especially mm. for linguistic structure, mm. that could be a very good idea. But I think in terms of using disfluencies in the generated utterance, I think we need to be a bit careful on the trade-off between like how natural the utterance sounds versus you know its safety and deployment so uh, for example there was a system called google duplex in 2018 which included disfluencies in its text-to-speech outputs and it sort of like convinced humans that they were talking to other humans because the disfluencies led the utterance to sound super natural mm. so um I think that can lead to anthropomorphization of systems that is attributing like real human-like qualities to these systems. Uh, so I think we have to be very careful when we're thinking of the generated utterance, how natural it sounds, and the safety of the deployment of the system. Yeah, I agree. I guess also a system that shows emotions maybe or adds this, this it should be sensitive perhaps to emotions, but maybe it shouldn't fake its own emotions. In, uh, so maybe... It's just something that came yeah. to my mind when you were talking about disfluency because so if I'm asking the question in text, it's different than if I'm asking the question in audio, uh, like in speech. But also sometimes you, if I tell you how to go to a university of uh, what's called, so you would think that I'm actually not sure about this. So maybe you would, the, a person would just, do you mean this or that? So maybe understanding also the facial expressions, the gestures that I'm actually, how I'm expressing it in our kind of human-human conversation, we make use of that a lot. and. 
we know if the person is confident in this or maybe no, I mean, this is, maybe they mean something else and, and so on, so this kind of interaction. Yeah. yeah. And does this link to, link for you, for anything in this collaborative yeah, conversation I mean, I think it's sense? Yeah, fluencies can be markers of having a problem uh, mm. of some type of memory, maybe a memory problem, or you don't know what you're yeah. referring to. And so that can be a moment where collaboration and negotiation could happen. So I think on the input side, yeah, making these systems much more sensitive to users' disfluencies and what they actually mean mm. is yeah, a really interesting thing to work on. Yeah. And, I, and I guess just to return back to you as well, that um, uh, this con these contextual cues, as if the problem becomes more multimodal, we are talking about the situation of who you're speaking to being a contextual cue, but maybe where and what you're speaking to in your context of self-driving cars might might also influence the kinds of yeah, uh, conversation absolutely. the AI should make. Yeah, I I agree completely. I, I'm I think these are really exciting problems, and I I mean honestly, in the preceding discussion, the idea of having um, these indirect, not word-based markers of uncertainty, um, it, yeah, I think that's very exciting, both as, as people have been saying, from the perspective of understanding when someone might not be meaning what they're saying because they don't know the right word, yeah. but also for a system, like, you know, if ChatGPT sort of had a prosody in rendered speech that made it sound like a manic person who's making stuff <laughs> up on the spot, yeah. then maybe I would feel right. better about it. Because you're like, <laughs> yeah. Feels more human. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we began to touch on um, conversational safety and trust and, and these sorts of topics already naturally in this conversation. Is there something that you particularly want to add on the topics of tr trustworthiness and explainability that are, are related to these conversational systems? Um, and then we'll talk about turn to some audience questions. Well, I, got, I want to highlight, I think it's one of the big problems of our time coming up that you know these large language models can generate spurious content as I said at scale very rapidly and looking very convincing mm -hmm. so I mean I know there's a lot of hype around uh, these things but it's partly justified um, we're, I think we're at an another moment in history which is sort of somewhat similar to you know the printing press the internet mm -hmm. these kind of things where uh, there's an amazing opportunity um, to make tools that are incredibly useful and there's a responsibility to try and harness them in a way that um, the content in particular that they generate is somehow grounded and controlled. Um, so, yes, Yeah, I agree. They have fantastic potential for, for helping us, but also we need to make sure we u u use them in the correct manner. Does any of you guys have I guess transparency, I like this yeah. word a lot, just so that the, I mean, we understand maybe what we're talking about, but yeah. if for the public, for any, for people who don't understand how these systems work at all, I think there is some kind of responsibility on like kind of, um, kind of presenting whatever we're producing in the right way so that it doesn't, doesn't look as if it's a human. No, I mean, I'm not a human, you're not talking yeah. to a human. This kind of transparency in that manner, I think. Yeah, it's important. Yeah, for example, these models that say, "I'm sorry, I can't answer this question about my emotions. I'm a language model," or this that's is a not start, bad. That's great. I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it, exactly, exactly. That's yeah. that's that's the thing. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, I I guess um, maybe a quick final question in this um, part, which is from your perspective, what do you envisage in terms of future interactions with conversational AI? Sort of maybe in terms of tasks, environments, roles, number of interlocutors. What do you see that excites you in that space of future developments? We've all touched on them. I mean, I, th I think that um, AI and machine learning has enormous potential to yield sort of good decisions and potentially less biased decisions for all of the problems we've seen with some systems. Um, but I think that understanding the provenance of these decisions is really important. Um, and I think that, you know, if people will use this example of a machine turning you down for a mortgage, right, and giving you this sort of inscrutable non-explanation for what happened. Mm -hmm. um, 
I think we're going to see more of that, and I think we're going to see medical decision support helping doctors make better decisions. But if you can't understand the provenance of that decision, mm -hmm. if you can't sort of say citation needed, um, then I think these systems are, I think that the, the advantages of them won't be realized because people don't trust them. And I think that it's going to lead to a lot of bad feelings, it, even if they are yielding good decisions. So yeah, to my eye, I think like, and I think people have already hinted at this, this, this idea of grounding is, is, it isn't just that it's grounded, but we find some way for systems to be grounded in a way where you can interrogate them efficiently without having to be an expert in their internals. Yeah. Yeah, interrogate them in a way that the user can also understand yeah. and is transparent. Yeah, I completely agree. Thanks for making that point. Do you yeah, and just to, I guess to add to that, yeah. I think negotiation is an important part of that process of kind of interrogating. What, why do you think that? You know, why did you say that? Why did mm. you make that decision? So we need to have kind of natural language conversation as a way of explaining AI decisions. And it's a really hard problem to make that a reality. Yeah. But, you know, conversation is the natural way, the natural interface for humans to figure out why, why each other, why did we do that? Yeah. What, you know, what justifies that? So I think the, I totally agree that that's a really important thing to, to build kind of transparent systems that are explainable in natural language conversation. Um, so that's, that's one, the question was where do I see things going? Yeah. Or I hope, I hope things will go in that direction. And in addition to that, there's also just the idea of um, making the context of a conversation much bigger than it currently is. Mm. So we've just started to add images and to some extent videos as something that you can have a conversation about. But we can add other modalities like facial expressions, gestures of the user. We're also adding multiple users. So you have more than one person in a conversation with a system. That's something we're working on. All of these things, are generally expanding the notion of context of a conversation. So the context becomes really wide. It can even be the screen of your phone that you're looking at while you're talking. Everything becomes part of the context of a conversation and that's, that's what humans do. Yeah. So we're moving slowly and piece by piece in that direction. Yeah, it's really I'll just add to that. Definitely agree 100%, and I think as well maybe also Asians talking to each other as well. So mm -hmm. everybody yeah. is going to be yeah. very kind of having stuff that are situated or maybe just embedded, so you wouldn't. It just happens naturally, right? The conversations and the and context-based as well. So. Yeah, I guess making sense of the context and making all these different modalities come together in a way According that we can interpret or yeah. models can interpret in a way that makes them behave in a reasonable manner. You mentioned you were quite excited about some future directions. Uh, yes, so I, I just want to follow the point about explainability. I think it's really important to have explainability. I think that right now, this is just a general issue maybe in tech where you might even sort of scroll past the terms and conditions and just click I agree and <laughs> may not necessarily be aware of all the ways that your data is being collected and analyzed. So, you know, with the introduction of things like analyzing disfluencies, multimodal cues, I think we have to have uh, clear explainability and very um, specific use cases for tools of how this can be used to empower people. So we don't want people to, you know, we don't want their humanity to be reduced to data points, basically. Mm. So um, I really hope in the future to see more explainability. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. I think I'm going to turn to some audience questions because I've been watching them add up on the screen. And um, <clears throat> so, so the question with the most votes is, do you think human-like is a good objective? Oh, it was the one. Uh, when designing automated conversational agents, and how do we define human-like? Human -like? So, good question. <laughs> Does anyone want to bid for that question? <laughs> so, yeah. I was, many years ago, at um, a sort of UK research council workshop on human-like computing. And we spent the better part of a day bickering What's human -like? about <laughs> what human-like is, to the extent that we should want a system to be human-like, and there was no consensus whatsoever. Mm. Um, and I think there are ways that it's good to be human-like and ways that it's not. So, yeah. um, so like one thing that it turns out you can show people will do is they will make stories up that are utter fictions about why they made decisions. Mm. So you can give someone two choices, two sort of arbitrary cards that they can pick, and they pick one and then you use a little, little bit of sleight of hand to say like, oh, here's the card you picked, but it's not the card they picked. 
And in many cases, people will come up with some sort of fiction about why they picked the card that <laughs> they didn't. Um, so I do think we, we need to be clear that people have lots of problems and we shouldn't <laughs> blindly <laughs> seek to emulate them. Yeah, there's some, yeah. Yeah, um, but I think we've enumerated lots of ways that it's good to be human-like as well. Yeah, it's a tricky trade-off because uh, in terms of human language, we still don't really understand all of the choices that we make when we're interacting and so then you need psychology and cognitive science and <coughs> linguistics and many other fields to tell us out more about this. Many humans are biased as well, we don't want yeah. bias. <laughs> yeah, exactly, like do we want our, yeah, it is to be so biased. Uh, yeah, I'd like to add to that that there was um, research by Roger Moore and colleagues about why is it, you know, in like children's cartoons or fiction, always when you have something like an agent, it has a very robotic voice. It doesn't necessarily have this human-like voice. So why do we always now in the real world have all these voice assistant technologies with, you know, like a very specific gendered voice, for mm. example? Uh, we don't we don't necessarily need to design systems that have all those, so to speak, human-like qualities. Yeah, I completely agree with you there. Yeah. I completely agree with you there. So I guess I would say that it's really good to be human-like in your ability to process input mm. from humans. So ideally you'd be able to deal with all kinds of conversational things and gestures that people do yeah. on the input side, but I think what we all seem to be agreeing on is that the output side needs to be perhaps not necessarily nice. human-like, especially since these systems are kind of got superhuman access to information. They're kind of like a very super well-informed uh, person to some extent, but then of course we know there are all problems with bias and so on in, in that data. So, so yeah, for me it's like, yeah, be human-like on your ability to process humans actually interacting with you, but on the output side be a lot, maybe you don't need to emulate all the crazy things that humans do. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I agree. I think, for example, if um, these models learn to speak very confidently, it's very human-like, I'm very confident in my information, uh, um, but perhaps models shouldn't do that when underlyingly they're maybe much more uncertain about that information than, um, than yeah. Um, maybe I go to another question, which is... Ah, related. Um, uh, so, um, if we're trying to make... I think we've maybe begun to answer it, but I'll read it out just in case. Um, we're trying to make conversational agents more human-like, but at the same time, um, we're cautioning against anthropomorphism. Um, is not this a fundamental conflict for this whole area? Do we need other kinds of interfaces for AI? So I think we've begun to, to answer that already. Um, and so maybe I... Unless somebody wants to add one extra thing, I think we mentioned yeah, yeah, that I think this so. should be a mix, right? So yeah. we, we we pick the, the the stuff that are useful for us, but then not yeah. the rest of it. Um, I would just like to add. I think we need like very specifically designed use cases. You yeah. know, <coughs> not this huge like like you know just this complete artificial bot that will completely keep you company. And there's there's not really like specific use cases as to how. So I think if we have sort of like these specific use cases, then we can focus on like whether it should be a little bit more anthropomorphized or you know, what kind of qualities do we want this bot to have, so yeah. Yeah, that's a great point. The, the context, context in which it's used actually should also influence how it, how it um, yeah. displays. Yeah, nice that both our most highest ranked questions are in this topic. Um, so, ah, so another question that's also related is, what about AI replicating human bias? Um, for example, exactly as you were mentioning, um, particularly gendered voices in AI, and um, AI um, being polite, even in the face of users trying to antagonize them. Um, and so how do we protect um, society from these kinds of biases? A very challenging question that um, maybe is we can speak to a little. Um, okay, so I, I can start. Thank um, you. Well, I first want to shamelessly plug a colleague um, in my lab, Nicholas Spitsakis. He works on um, how to model individual annotator perspectives. Mm. That's what his PhD topic is about, because if you have something like abuse detection or hate speech detection, ideally what you might do is have three people label whether something was abusive or not, and if they disagree, you might take an average and have one majority label in the end. And that's sort of how these majority perspectives, um, you know, then get fed into conversational systems, etc. 
So he's working a little bit also on how to annotate and model individual annotator <coughs> perspectives. So I think mm -hmm. that's one way to sort of mitigate bias by having different kind of annotator perspectives present in the data set. I would think as well, I mean, it's a very interesting question. I mean, don't, I don't have kind of a clear answer, but something to think about is, is, is a word that also I'm, I'm interested in thinking about who are the people who's testing these models, who are actually the people who are collecting the data from. So something uh, that I'm interested in is this idea of inclusion. So in order to kind of try to reduce bias, maybe we can collect more data, maybe we can have specific user, maybe user groups from specific societies or specific, so to include more inclusion of more kind of representation in the data collection, maybe in the testing, maybe in the evaluation, to get to have this, to have more idea about how to be, so for the system to be inclusive in a way, so which hopefully would reduce bias. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think you make a really good point. There is, um, maybe I now plug a little bit what's going on in Aberdeen. Yeah. So um, uh, my colleague Ehud Reiter has a student who's investigating how people from different cultures and backgrounds interrogate GPT-3 for <coughs> coding answers. And so the way that you frame the question has a huge impact on the, the output that you get out, given the fact that this model is trained on a certain way and will interact with you in a certain way. Depending on how you ask the question, you get a relatively different result. So I think that's uh, very interesting and related. And so we, and maybe these models um, should be aware of the, who, they're who they're talking to and why, how to interpret what's going on. It poses its own set of problems. Yeah. I can see some frowns and nods, maybe, or something to chip in. No, okay. Um, okay. Uh, ah, so the next highest related question is, do you think conversational AI could lead to a homogenization of language, and should this be resisted? So that's interesting, wow. given what we were just talking about with different people and cultures. And yeah, I mean, it's a really good question because yeah, a, a, a lot it obviously relates to the bias issue because mm. if you kind of remove uh, somehow, somehow you you have a vision that you might get to some kind of core data set without bias in it that's somehow safe, and it's a really difficult problem to even try to do that. But yeah. It, I suppose it may, um, the inference is that then you have this kind of homogenization. Mm. I, I guess the way I, I see it is there's an amazing, the amazing diversity of humans needs to be reflected in the, the, all the different data sets we collect. And at the moment, we don't have that. So I think we need to push it the opposite direction. And instead of sort of narrowing down to a small, you know, safe, unbiased data set, we probably need to have a hugely different set of diverse data collections and then I don't know the answer to this but how you pool how you kind of pool those and, uh, and, and and mix those together in a particular system for a particular user in a particular use case yeah, yeah. Remains, <laughs> remains an open question that, that, that does remain an open question yeah yeah I would think personalization I mean there is mm -hmm. some work yeah. on this kind of instead of just having a general system that does everything or maybe that could be a backbone but then on top of it depends on the context depends on where as well so if you have this assistant at home so maybe it's a good idea that it learns about the person and mm. kind of be this kind of long life learning and their topics so I have a that. question about that so <laughs> do you want? Do we want to reflect back the bias of the user that we're talking to? So I think we need to remove <laughs> the bias, but pick the traits in a way. So if it's mm -hmm. like a specific way of, 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 of I don't know. I'm mm. just thinking. I'm really coming up with the answers here. I don't have. We don't have a great answer to this question, well, but we're trying to think what could be done. Yeah, I mean, I, I think part of the subtext to the the question that was asked about this homogenization of language to be. If we imagine that as we go forward, more and more of us will say, well, I, I could write this thing myself, or I could get mm. a chatbot mm. to generate it, and then I could put that on my website, which two years hence gets used as the training data. And so you see this like the steady it's movement a, for yeah. like chatbot ease as the lingua franca of the internet, yeah. which sounds really grim and depressing. <laughs> <to me. laughs> um, yeah. And I, I, like, I do think that the, this idea that 
understanding the context of the user and the community of the user and trying to allow their, their sort of their voice and their linguistic conventions to drive what they get will hopefully mitigate this a little bit. I hadn't, I, I hadn't actually thought about this idea of personalization as preventing us from getting into this like incredibly dystopian linguistic melting pot, but yeah. yeah, it does seem like that sensitivity is important in that way. Yeah, true. Maybe it would even like, yeah, condense into one particular area of language, but perhaps the fact that we're very creative language users in general and humans language is always changing and we're always developing new linguist like slang and different communities of speakers use language in a different way um, maybe we're not quite at the homogenization stage maybe we're at the try to get everything and then um, collect and then then we see what happens next with that were you looking like you had to um yeah, I, I just wanted to also say that it would be great to see, and, and there already is a lot of research also into like low resource languages because mm -hmm. these language models are huge and they could never really like port to languages that are low resourced. And it is like a lot of low resource languages that could really use this technology in some ways, you know, to empower people. For example, you know, if someone's illiterate but everyone has a phone, they know how to, you know, maybe speak through the phone and try to get like information back. So. I think that we should also really like uh, look at lower source languages and I think there's a lot of research being done in that area. Yeah, yeah, yeah a really exciting area is sort of to make use of what language we can learn from more data and try to bootstrap a bit, make, use, make up for the lack in others. Um, okay. Uh, so we have a lot more questions about the humanness of AI. Um, that I think we've begun to cover. So maybe this is more a question towards you about um, mod modeling empathy and emotions. And so we're back to examples of current um, chatbots where maybe they can mimic appropriate human responses to behavior. So I guess we're talking the questions touching on deception. Um, how do is, is there some problematic trade-off, I'm trying to paraphrase this question, um, between models eliciting trust where they don't really feel either in terms of negative or emotional, that they give emotional support? Um, it's a very hard question to paraphrase. Um, I can just elaborate yes, on the topic in general. Thank you. I, mean, <laughs> I think, I mean, when I mean empathy as well as this understanding of emotions, and this, I mean, again, it will depend on the context. So where are we putting this chatbot or where is this agent? Not, not a chatbot is going to be deployed. So, so I do a lot of work on mental health, for example, understanding some of these stuff. So if we are, and there are, there are some research as well that people might chat with kind of an agent or a robot and basically disclose some information. So mm. you want the answer not to be kind of facts-like. I mean, so if it understands that, and emotions is very wide word as well. I don't want to, s emotions not, does not necessarily mean happy, sad, I mean, maybe maybe the word emotion might not. Sometimes we call it the mental state as well. So, for example, in the car, for example, environment in the smart car, so maybe an agent can pick that the person is confused and they don't know how to find or they are actually frustrated from this. So this kind of mental states, if they are integrated in understanding uh, of the language, it can just kind of um, help in like the way also, I mean, we can also give a personality, right? Or maybe give, or the way the answer uh, that the, the, the system uh, or the model or the agent answers back. I mean, because we can paraphrase different languages, uh, different kinds of sentences in different ways. In the same way, I mean, we talk with each other. If it's like a setup is a, a panel different than if we're just chatting with friends. So it depends. So I think it's just to be more, it's, it's part of the adap adaptivity mm. and it's part as well of Again, it's, I think it's one of the good parts about human life. So if it just like answers in a tone that's actually kind of relaxing, if you're basically stressed, it's just a matter of the tone <coughs> of the voice. That's how I see yeah. it in a way. I don't know if that answers the yeah, question. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, it was a very badly formed question. So I think I, I, I do also like this application where these models can be used as help or as, as care in like um, medical situations. Yeah. I know maybe it's Oliver, for, you've got some elderly, examples example, of some your work. Yeah, I mean, maybe I should yeah. elaborate. I mean, because I'm a yeah, bit skeptical yeah. about some, yeah. uh, like if you're trying to pretend to be somebody's friend and you're not mm. a real person or Deception. you're faking an em empathic kind of response. I'm not sure we really want to be building that. I think we have to be, again, like on the input side, we have to be sensitive to whether somebody is stressed or confused. Mm. 
you know, so to process those kind of, you know, facial expressions, if we, if we can do it accurately as well, is very important because you don't want to get it wrong. Yeah. Um, so we try to build systems which are somewhat sensitive to user input of that type. But on the output side, again, you really want to be careful about doing things, for example, like giving advice to people, especially in a medical context. So um, what we try to do is answer questions in a factual way, yeah. but be very careful to try to never give advice or recommend a course of action. Talk about the tone <laughs> of the voice of the agent. I mean, it's not, not, I mean, the language could be the same, right? But it could be different setup might require, the, I mean, that's how I see it in a way. Yeah. Like if it's just a tone, yeah. if it's a, if I'm talking to a child, maybe I can just use a voice that's, I don't know, this kind of adaptive or context aware. Uh, yeah, I think certain, I the certainly. I mean, it's some, not there yet, but some uh, types of adaptivity something. like that, where that where it, where it doesn't influence the actual content, yeah. I think is really good. Um, but we find when, for example, we did this Alexa Prize thing some time ago, and we found that um, the system mm -hmm. was being treated like a, a companion by mm. people. And sometimes that was really positive. You know, some people were saying, oh, I love talking to you every day. This is so great. But on the other hand, it was also, um, you know, ethically questionable uh, to some extent that whether people were treating this as a, you know, a proxy human when it really isn't. Yeah. So I think, you know, this was f about five or six years ago we'd started doing this work. And since then, things have really moved on. And I think the consensus really is that we shouldn't be pretending Protecting. in this kind of way. Yeah, to make sure yeah. that the human always understands that the AI is an AI right. and, and what it's capable of. Yeah, so make, making sure that there's less of this deception, maybe more conversational <laughs> bounce off. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, so I, maybe I'm, I'm conscious of the time. Perhaps I want to get you to t maybe tell us a bit about where, you, where you're excited about and see, your, see yourself wanting to work in or given what we've discussed about um, um, multiple modalities and the risks that are going on, um, where are you excited about working on in the future? What work are you excited about seeing in this area in the future? And I'll start with Chris. Um, so to be clear, I don't, I don't work in conversational AI per se, but I'm, I am very excited about some research areas that I think are related to some Adjacent. of the things we've talked about. Yeah. So to start with, I think there's an increasing recognition both in machine learning, but also in sort of cognitive science that we need to respect the diversity of human um, mental life a little bit more. So understand that people solve problems in different ways. They have different values. They have different expectations. They have different prior beliefs. Um, and actually even psychologists since time immemorial have been like, well, this is what people are like, which is in the kind of experiments I do, you, if you look at the data, you're just like, that's rubbish. Um, and I think we're starting to get the tools to actually talk in precise ways about the diversity of human mental lives in ways that allow us to understand people and help them achieve their goals and help them seek explanations and, and facts um, in ways that um, might sort of cater to their idiosyncrasies. Um, so yeah, I think that there are sort of technical innovations but also scientific innovations that are, are pretty exciting in those areas. Tanvi, what are you going to be working on in this space? Uh, yeah, I, I think that I uh, will focus a lot more on the safety of these systems and how they can be sort of deployed in the real world and, uh, you know, used as tools to empower people, but, you know, still making sure that maybe people have explainability of these tools, they don't anthropomorphize the system, um, yeah, as well as, like, clear defined use cases, so... Uh, very interested to uh, see how we can make these systems more safe in the future. Yeah. Yeah. Can I ask a follow-up here about mm -hmm. um, sort of this um, safety part about maybe user priv privacy? Will some of your work touch on this or not, not so much like maintaining like self-disclosure when it comes to these and making use of data? You said you don't want to... Yeah, should um, be aware. well, never say never, but mm. uh, like, I hope to touch on that maybe in the future. Mm. I, I think that right now I'd like to focus on, you know, like 
now we have a little bit more sophisticated environment to understand really long user utterances, right? The user might switch from things like monologue, and then somewhere in the middle they might have an intent and they might switch back to monologues. So, uh, you know, trying to focus on all these different prosodic and disciplines cues to, you know, understand the linguistic structure of the utterance, but maybe not going into these complex and subjective tasks of personality computing or trying to, like, analyze all these signals to predict, you know, how emotional someone is, for example. I think we need to be very careful when getting into those, like, much more complex subjective tasks. So, yeah. yeah. I don't know if that answered Thanks. your yeah, question. Yeah, you Thank you, Maya. Well, um, okay, so um, also my work is more focusing on vision and multimodality, so yeah, this so kind of the human behavior understanding. So um, I'll probably, I'm interested in keep doing that work. I think I mentioned some of the challenges, I mean, to mix data from different modalities is not straightforward. Uh, how to, can you map between one modality to the other? How can, are they complementary? Are they actually redundant information? So this kind of the technical side of how machine learning work, explainability of course as well when we get a decision at the end, even if we're mixing a lot of modalities. So which part was important, which part was, yeah, this kind of the modeling of the human. Um, and I think context also is very important. So especially for the mental uh, states or this stuff. So for example, in a specific situation in the car, what's, int what's important, maybe we just pick on confusion and pick on like, for example, maybe just if it's happy or sad, kind of the valence, so just very simple kind of, um, if we know that's a positive situation or just a negative situation, how, how so understanding of the human, uh, um, yeah, and also, I mean, I do some work on animal behavior understanding as well. So if we think that we have a pet at home as well, do we want them as well? We want to understand from the video that there is a pet at home and how mm. can we interact with that as this agents or can interact uh, maybe in non-conversational, but in mm -hmm. more kind of being adaptive in a way. We have colleagues who work on um, animal computer interaction, so that could Animal be... Animal computer interaction, what does that look like? <laughs> well, if you, can, if you can get like the dog at home, what's, yeah. what will happen? I mean, <laughs> do they just kind of push a button? What does that mean? I mean, it's still kind of an early field, but there's lots of work on that. As oh, well how interesting. Up. I see that will be integrated in a way, okay. I think. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, wow. That's a different topic, so yeah, we talk about really that. Maybe we should have, we should have talked more no, about I just this. wanted to touch on it, yeah. just to say that's part, probably yeah. going to be part of the story at some point in the future. Yeah, yeah. Oh, how exciting. Oh. So yeah, I think there's two directions that I'm interested in, uh, in and excited by. The first one is more short-term direction, which is visual conversation and putting visual, visual context into conversations. So to some extent, that's already happening. Um, so you can now talk about images, you can ans ask and answer questions about images, you can describe images, so that's moving into video. And that's really useful, particularly, well, we're working with the RNIB for blind and partially sighted people in, in our company. We're building an app to help people actually talk about their surroundings um, and answer questions in, in this visual conversational way. So I think that's a kind of short to, <coughs> short to medium term big advance that's to some extent already happening. And then in the longer term, um, I think it can, the exciting direction is in having negotiation about uh, you know, transparent, uh, uh, transparent communication about why decisions were made and um, being able to also have this kind of negotiation that's around the diversity of the way that humans talk, what the, how they talk about um, different tasks, different visual scenes is incredibly diverse and, in, and in, in order to accommodate that we need to have systems that can negotiate meanings with humans and I think that is kind of more medium to long term um, exciting work that's going to happen I think. Yeah, that is really interesting. Is it something that you're working on uh, with your academic hat on, or is it something you're working on with your <laughs> Alana AI hat on? Both. So yeah, Both. We, the way the way we work is we do sort of most really blue sky stuff in the lab, and mm. then we try to translate that into real world applications in the company. So yes, we're we're doing aspects of those problems with yeah. both hats on, yeah. Okay, oh cool. Could you ex just maybe add a little example of um, something to do with these collabor collaborative negotiation dialogues, maybe just to give a bit of context? Um, yeah, so context? if you have a, uh, a partially sighted person wanting to know, you know, oh, where's my mug? Uh, the system is like, okay, m I'm looking for a mug, but what, what does your mug look like? Mm. Oh, it's the red one 
the, ah. with a heart on it or whatever. Okay. So that's just a really simple example of a negotiation of meaning that's specific to this particular user. And a system has to be able to adapt its understanding of language to that negotiated meaning. But it could even be in retail if I, you know, I'm looking for some cheap sneakers. The system offers me sneakers for $200. I go, well, that's not cheap. Yeah. Cheap is under 50. Yeah. There's a very local meaning negotiation of what cheapness means for that user in the context of buying sneakers. And that is a negotiation between a human and an agent. And I see a long-term vision where all companies will have their AI agents. We will all have our own AI agents and they will negotiate with each other uh, about these kind of things and we'll be able to talk about it afterwards. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I, I want to end on this final question that has incredible number of upvotes, and I put it to everyone, which is, if the AI is in a lift or eleva eight elevator, will it be able to speak to Scottish people to get them <laughs> to floor 11? <laughs> I don't know if for context if everyone has seen that video, but, um, but um, maybe. <laughs> anyway, thank well, you very much. Oh, you're going to answer, please. I was told yeah. that Google was working on specific acoustic models for all kinds of different British regional mm. accents. Ah. But I was told that some years ago, and I'm not sure it's ever mm. really Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would say that um, I have colleagues in ah. ILCC at the University of Edinburgh who, have, ah. who years ago said that they were engaging with precisely this kind of problem. So, right. So hopefully we'll okay. be here. Yeah. Ah. sorted. I'm yeah. glad to hear it's being worked on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much, speakers. You. Um, I think that this is 5-2. This is where we have to stop questions. And thank you so much for the audience questions. I wasn't able to answer them all. They're all on relatively similar themes that I was pleased to see, and I hope that we began to answer some of them. Um, thank, thank you. you.